Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com and by RockAuto.com. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. And that is the fine voice of Alec Webb. Thank you, Alec, and welcome to Motor Week Podcast number 148. And around our, I never can figure out what to call this table, our unusual shaped table in Studio C. Pseudo triangle. What? It's a pseudo triangle. A pseudo triangle table. We have, of course, the assistant producer, Greg Carlos, whose voice you just heard. That is me. Our road test producer, Ben Davis. Ben Davis here. I think it's table on legs. Table on legs. (laughs) Our online content coordinator, Patrick Lucas. Hello. And by phone, our FYI reporter, Lauren Morrison. She's Lauren, we have a picture of you on the desk, by the way. Oh, all right, all right. Let me scoot over a little bit. You're kind of cramping me. (laughs) Those of you that are watching the podcast, Lauren uh, basically is reporting from Florida. In a couple of minutes, you'll figure out why. Uh, We'll have our lightning round, our viewer question, our rant and rave session. Uh, Florida, you can tell us about Florida drivers. Uh, Lauren. Oh, yeah, they really liked that last time. Yeah. Yeah, we had a, quite a few yeah, comments. Maybe we, maybe we should skip that. Yeah. All right, let's get to the vehicles we're going to talk about. Um, long time coming, 2016 Mazda CX-9. Uh, we uh, had a lot of experience with the first-generation CX-9. It got very old in the tooth. It was still V6-powered, but uh, quite capable otherwise than that. This is a very big departure, uh, four-cylinder turbo. What do you think? Is it a good successor? Did it bring uh, their large crossover, um, you know, up to uh, specs to be competitive? And what about no uh, V engine? I think they're uh, going in the right direction there. They're downsizing the engine. I mean, now that gas prices are plummeting temporarily, yeah, it's, it's really not as big of a deal. But I mean, that's the way to go. You, you more efficiency is always good, and if you can make a four cylinder that moves a car that size around in a, in a decent fashion, then why not? And, you know, it did pretty well. It was like 0 to 60 in 7 seconds, which, I had no which problems for a big with crossover it. is pretty good. Yeah, I had no problems with it. Tons of space, and it's uh, definitely the update, in sty- the, the update to the styling is uh, very welcome. I thought it was handsome. The inside is uh, everything that you've seen in newer Mazdas, like a Mazda 6 or, or 3. It's all there. You got the center controller. You got the the screen pops up out of the um, well, not actually not physically pops up, but it sits on mm-hmm. top of the dash. Which love it or hate it, that's kind of a Mazda thing now. So yeah, I thought it's well all done. Right. All right, here's the question. I, I think the vehicle is very competitive, uh, and I agree with you 100. percent I have two issues. One is I'm not in love with the styling. It looks to me like a a train engine, but okay, that's a personal (laughs) thing. Uh, And I don't mean, you know, a silver streak. Does it pay enough homage to the Mazda Zoom Zoom mantra? Does it handle better than vehicles of this class? Is someone that that hates the idea of having basically a, a grocery getter in their parking lot but says at least this one gives me some... Uh, relief at a reasonable price, does it do it? Hmm. That is a good question. I think that it certainly feels like it wants to be um, more of a a handler than than other SUVs in its segment. Um, The steering, as I can recall, was a little bit heavier, which is a positive thing. uh, The uh, comments from the road test from the track work were it was was numb, but that it was uh, very uh, responsive. And that that combined with even though the springs were soft, it didn't roll as much as, say, you might have expected in a large three row. Yeah, I think that Zoom Zoom mantra is, is, is kept in mind here. But what you should keep in mind is that it's still a That's full size That's not why people SUV. buy these right, vehicles exactly. for. <laughs> so, yeah, it's there. But don't expect that it's going to drive like a Mazda 6 or a 3. I thought it had a good uh, cargo capacity. I, I'm trying to remember um, the uh, the seats folded easily. There wasn't a lot of space between the second and third row shelf, second row seats down in the third row shelf. So that's good if you've got something back there that you don't want to fall in the cracks. I thought they did a real good job. Yeah, absolutely. Really um, good job. I, I did the, uh, the last one we had, our long term, which was the last year of that uh, the old, really old generation. Gen. I thought that was... Very sporty, especially with the V6. Um, So this one, obviously, is not going to compare to that. But I think they were going, especially the one we had, they were going a lot more for that 
not pseudo, but near luxury kind of because mm-hmm. didn't Easily. have the, had that brand new whatever their highest newest trim package is now the Grand some they're Grand not, Touring, but there's something beyond that. There was there? something beyond like it. Like his name escapes me. But too. yeah, but. But yeah, I thought it was quite luxurious. Yeah, absolutely. But you know that we had a comment. What we we talked about it on a previous podcast that that all of these mid level brands are now bringing out top trim levels mm-hmm. that might as well be a, they're luxurious. Yeah, I don't exactly. Know, yeah. Any other word for it? Reminded me of a budget uh, Volvo XC90 a little bit. You know, Maybe it even styling, looks a little bit like that. Yeah. That's a very good way to describe it. So, uh, you know, I didn't have any problems with the four cylinder turbo. I thought it did really, really well, and frankly, a whole lot of the. Uh, SUVs and crossovers we've been getting in here the last two years have been four, two two liter you know turbo engines, uh, and they've done very very well. So if that is one of your buying criteria, I would get past it because your reward is going to be you know high twenties in the fuel economy instead of the low twenties. So. And, um, you know, people keep saying, well, turbos used to be unreliable. You know, get a life. That was 30 years ago. (laughs) (laughs) You heard it. Get a life, people. The turbos today are hugely uh, reliable. Primarily because what they're doesn't wonderful. have a turbo anymore now? I mean, it's... Uh, and we you haven't seen anything yet. The the next uh, and this is getting off the subject, but there are, the next step in turbos to save fuel economy are going to be electric driven turbos. Nice, they're coming in uh, oh, very baby. quickly. I so, think somebody uses one of those as a secondary turbo and electric one to. I think you might be right to take out lag from the primary. That's, That's the, right, they the do. Nine, isn't it the newest nine eleven? Newest nine eleven, I think. Yeah. You might be right. There's something else. There's something else. Could be right. But anyway, electric turbos. So just when you get used to uh, really reliable uh, exhaust-driven turbos, electric turbos are coming. Let's move on to uh, the uh, Nissan Pathfinder, which gets a, a minor refresh, yeah. a mid-cycle refresh for 2017. I should stay, say going in, this is one of our all-time favorite uh, three-row uh, unibody crossovers. Uh, we gave it our Best Large Crossover Award, I think it was in 2013. Uh, so we're very fond of it. Uh, it was getting a little long in the tooth. So, Benny, do you think they brought it up to, to uh, modern specs? Absolutely. Um, just from looking at at it, you get your more familiar uh, V Motion grill that Murano has and uh, Maxima. Uh, it's refreshed in the back as well. Um, motion activated tailgate, finally, maybe. <laughs> well, that's, you know, <laughs> is that where you have to no, that's, that's a little too harsh. I, I think that's, that's apropos that they added that. Sure, Probably yeah. Probably was needed. Um, little they, things like we have two USB ports up front now instead of one. Um, a lot of safety tech comes with it that wasn't available before. The uh, center display between the TAC and Speedo is upgraded and um, talks directly with your 8-inch uh, in, uh, center inf- inf- uh, infotainment screen. So now you have uh, nav direction and stuff pop up instead of just basic um, uh, trip computers and stuff that you had before. Do you think they've managed to stay competitive with uh, Pilot and Highlander? Which are both newer? Yeah, I mean there are they're definitely in, on an equal playing field now. I believe mm-hmm. um, it's all a matter of brand preference, but certainly I don't think you're you, you're not losing out anything by choosing a Nissan over over either of those two. Still, uh, still has a CVT. Um, and it's, I should point out, now. it still also has a six. So, but although it's a really good six, yeah, it's a three five. Everybody's familiar with that yeah. for sure. 11, uh, 11 to 1 compression pistons now bring it up to 284 horse, 259 torque, which mm-hmm. is pretty big. Uh, I found no problems with the CVT. Uh, granted, you're not going to. We got used It doesn't to screen it. performance, but it's not in casual driving, it's pretty seamless. So you got the CX9 if you want to get a little bit of performance, and it's certainly got a more modern powertrain. If you're looking for something more uh, traditional, uh, the Pathfinder is, does a good job. And, and and I agree with you. I think it's uh, on the same uh, playing field as, uh, say, the uh, pilot. Um, where is that market going? Do you think it's going towards more what the CX-9 has done, or do you think it's going to basically stay this more traditional path? I, I, I would like to see the Pathfinder take on what they did with the Murano, in which case— you know, like the the radical new styling, in which right. case, it would, I guess I'm saying it's going in the direction of the CX-9. Mm-hmm. With that sort of bold, radical new styling and 
downsizing power drains. And yeah, and I guess the new efficiency. one will still be several years away. Um, we've all sort of gotten used to the operation of CVTs, primarily because Nissan's done a very good job with it. They, they work much better than they used to be. So if you're in the market for a large three-row crossover, seven-passenger vehicle, two new ones to consider, the CX-9 along with the Nissan Pathfinder joining an incredibly competitive market with all the domestic stuff out there, plus uh, the um, um, pilot from Honda and um, Highlander from Toyota. And now for the main event of today's show, Lauren Morrison sitting in Florida is fresh back from the Miami International Auto Show, an auto show that up until recent years has not gotten the uh, play of some of the other uh, bigger shows. Lauren, was there a reason to be in Miami this year? I mean, I think the biggest reason was Nissan. They they uh, brought a lot of journalists out and to unveil their new 2017 Nissan Rogue, and then they also were showing off their 2017 Sentra SR Turbo. So I definitely think they were the big players at the auto show this year. Really, nobody else um, brought anything that we haven't seen before, and I think that's you know talking with other people there. They were saying the same thing. You know, this really, like you were saying, hasn't been the show to come to. You're not going to see anything that you haven't seen before. Um, so, I mean, they're definitely stepping up their game. They've made a few changes, and I think it's slowly getting better. But I mean, it's it's not on the level of a Detroit, Chicago, New York, L.A. Um, it's definitely the redheaded stepchild. I think. But uh, hopefully, I mean, it's, I think it's, it's slowly making a turnaround. But um, like I said, a lot of manufacturers just have stuff that we've already seen before. So, um, you know, a, I, a I'm, am, I'm amazed that there is not a big national car show in the southern half of the U.S. Yeah, I, I'm the same. I'm, I'm with you the same way. Um, you know, even you think maybe Atlanta, uh, somewhere, somewhere in the south. Um, but... I don't know. Hopefully, Miami's stepping up its game. I think, you know, the, even the convention center that they typically have it in, they're revamping that. I think 2018 uh, was when they're hoping to make some upgrades to the facility. I don't know. You know, I, I, it sounds like they're really trying to make this make this uh, on par with the other other shows, but I guess the really only time's going to tell. Tell us about the new Rogue. My understanding is it's a um, tiny bit smaller and that there's also a hybrid version. Yes, that was one of the big things. Um, they now have a hybrid version. Uh, it, the the Rogue has got a new look. It, um, I mean, it's definitely it's definitely a refresher. It has the um, what we were just talking about the where it, you know the automatic uh, back back door it opens when you slide your foot under it. So that was one of the big things. Uh, a lot of new safety features. Um, they played was, they played fairly conservative with the styling of yeah. it too, Deb, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, from looking at it, you, there's really not a whole lot of exterior, um, you know, differences. There's a lot of just little, little things, a lot of new um, technology inside, a lot of, like we were saying, a lot of new safety features just to get it on par, I think, with the other players in its field. Uh, what can you tell us about uh, the hybrid? Did they say anything about um you know, fuel economy goals or how much range it has in pure electric or anything like that? No, they did not. They didn't go over that. Um, they didn't even give, like, official pricing yet for the Rogue. So um, they said that's going to be – the hybrid's going to be arriving before the end of the year, but really didn't give a whole lot of info on what we're lo- looking with, with that. I'm also curious that given that auto sales have been dropping for the last uh, month or so, was there was there this is the first auto show we've been to this fall. How about how was the enthusiasm of the people there? Was it there was there a lot of energy or people worried or did you get any impression of like that at all? I didn't get any impression that anybody was worried. I mean, everybody it seems like there was a lot of enthusiasm, um, you know, a, a it didn't seem like anybody anybody was worried. Um, I think you know it's the first show of really the season, so I, you know I think people are just they're just gearing up for that. Um, it didn't seem like there was any anybody was stressed out. <laughs> And Lauren will uh, have a full report on the Miami International Auto Show. It'll pop up, uh, by, actually, by the time you hear this podcast, uh, it'll be on our website, motorweek.org. And she's got details of the Rogue and also uh, everything else that was either new or almost new uh, from Miami. Thanks, Lauren. No problem.
All right, let's move it. Stick around now for the rest of the show. I'm sure you've got something you can uh, contribute to this <laughs> yeah, uh, a, <laughs> a lightning round. Here we go. Our lightning round, where our panelists have two minutes to debate a trending automotive topic, and when time's up, they'll hear the bell. Patrick will hear. The American icon, the mid-sized family sedan. Some reports say it's dying. Uh, sales are way down. Uh, they were down in August, almost 30%. Uh, usually when this happens, uh, and we're talking about things like uh, Camry and Ford Fusion and Malibu, usually they, as they say in the automotive jargon, slap money on the hood and they start selling. But this time they did not. And this has actually been a trend. Uh, for the first time this year, it looks like they will be outsold by compact uh, SUVs or crossovers, as we usually call them. It's a fundamental change in the market. At the same time, you've got new brands like Genesis bringing on new four-door sedans. Is this a trend? Is it unexpected? It does seem to be a trend. Is it unexpected? Is it temporary? What do you think, guys? I don't. It doesn't really shock me, any of that stuff. Um, I think if you ask most people, pick some random people off the street, if they'd rather... Me. Yeah, if you pick yeah. a Patrick off the street, and <laughs> would you rather have... A low sitting car for you know four door sedan that gets twenty eight miles a gallon, or would you rather have something that sits a little bit higher has and also gets drive. has all wheel drive and also gets twenty eight miles per gallon, or, or even or if it doesn't, similar. maybe it gets twenty four. Right, but. but you get more right, you get more space and everything like that. I think just the people who are buying cars right now feel safer in something that sits higher. And honestly, I think even the small SUVs just. Look better than yeah. sedans. Mm-hmm. Sedans have gotten really complacent because they, they have are. been bestsellers There's for so long. There's a lot of them, a lot more of them probably than sedans. Well, what I was going to say is that they probably look better um, and they are more appealing because I think just by the way that the market has sort of dictated things that uh, automakers are putting a lot more time and resources into them. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, that's just a reflection of that. Obviously, they're putting all their research and development and product planning into those, and so sedans are just sort of. Oh, uh, well, you know, we'll get to it when we get to it. And if we have to do just a mid-cycle refresh for it, then whatever. You know, Lauren, you're in, you uh, now live in uh, Florida where, you know, you usually don't need all-wheel drive, although there's some argument that rain uh, is a good reason to have it. Do you still see down there even a lot more um, small to mid-size SUVs running around? I mean, what do you see besides the rental cars as far as sedans? I mean, I definitely think that they play a purpose down here, and, and Florida is just so diverse in, in you know, where you are. Um, I definitely think I see them on the roads, uh, even if there's not necessarily a need for them. I think a lot of people, like you guys are saying, just feel safer in them. I mean, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, uh, I see them on the road all the time down here. You know, obviously, South Beach, places like that, you're going to see people in convertibles and stuff like that. But, I mean, the rest of the state, I see them all the time. Yeah, I think SUVs are actually banned in South Beach, aren't they? I'm just kidding. All right, I'm going to give you a different take on on what's happening. If you look at the sales statistics, and this was brought up actually by uh, Automotive News, while in August the midsize sedans were down 30%, the compact sedan was down about 3.5%, which that's what the whole market was now. And, And remember now that when we get a compact sedan in, Time after time, we're saying in our road test, it's now big enough to be a midsize you know, rated vehicle. Yeah. And the so-called midsize sedans have grown to where they actually are almost up at the large sedan class. So I'm thinking that people that want a four-door sedan, and there's still millions of them, they're saying, why do I want to pay an extra five grand when this compact, all, as big as a mid use the midsize I'm replacing... I can get that for a whole lot less money, and it's even more fuel efficient. So I'm actually thinking they've lost a lot of those uh, mid-size buyers because they've gotten too big, and they're going not only for a better value in a, a compact SUV, but a much, much better value in a compact sedan. So you think, do you think it was oversight by the manufacturers, or you think no. it's just a shift in how people are I think it's a thinking? shift. People keep saying they want it bigger, they want the flexibility, so they made them larger <laughs> inside, they gave them split-folding rear seats, all of that to try and keep up probably a losing battle. Uh, against the SUVs that were just proliferating. But the people that do want the sedans, 
Uh, and again, there's still millions of them. They're just saying, I've got not only I can go big or I can replace what I've got, which is maybe a seven or eight year old sedan with something about the same size. But now it's called a compact. We just had in the newest Elantra. I don't know if you're a, a growing family of five and you want a sedan or you can only afford a sedan because they are less expensive. What else would you want? It's beautiful on the inside. It's highly reliable. Everything folds. You can get you know a lot of stuff in it, and it's very very affordable. So, Good point. anyway, uh, that's mine. Four Something minutes, that's fifteen why you're seconds. Four minutes and fifteen Penalty. seconds scrammed into two minutes. <laughs> All right, uh, viewer question from Bill. What sort of special maintenance do hybrids or EVs require? First of all, if you'll go on to uh, our YouTube uh, site, uh, YouTube slash MotorWeek, Bill, you'll find Pat Goss has got uh, a very good explanation on it. Uh, Otherwise, um, you know, if it's a hybrid, it's got both a gasoline engine and electric. So the gasoline engine still requires pretty much the same maintenance. Uh, Beyond that, I think Pat has said repeatedly you've got to take special uh, care to make sure all the connections are well maintained. Um, Perhaps that means keeping the engine compartment a little cleaner than you might have before. Uh, EVs, again, you're dealing with very high voltage electricity, so you certainly don't want to be messing around uh, in there yourself if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, but it takes uh, a technician that's trained was, in hybrids and EVs. I was about to ask. I'm going to expand yeah. this to a bigger question. Yeah. Um, this is for my own uh, curiosity. Do I like dealerships that, um, I guess, manufacturers, maybe like a Nissan, that Leaf is a big part mm-hmm. of their um, sales. Do they have like separate? Do like dealerships have like separate service bays that are just for EVs? Because I know it's different people, different equipment, stuff like that. I would be amazed if they didn't. Yeah. Uh, it might not be more than one or two. Yeah. I know that um, uh, not too long ago, uh, Yolanda Vasquez did a piece out in the West Coast where this uh, technician, it happened to be a, 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 a woman, oh, had that, opened yeah. up a shop, and all she does is hybrids, primarily Priuses, and she's got a waiting list of customers, and she's special Specializes in them, and they did, and we went in. They went into a lot of detail about all the extra things they have to do to check to make sure that they will have the reliability. So the short answer is, Bill. Yes, it does require a lot of extra care, but no, it's not do-it-yourself care outside of just cleanliness. And you need to deal with a dealer or a service technician that has been trained in them, and that's the probably the most important thing. Uh, rant and rave time. Anyone got something uh, on their mind? I got some. Oh, right. Here we go. All right. And it's actually not that big of a deal. Um, USB ports. For a while, them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. for a while, they were like, I remember even a couple of years ago, they were ta- that was like one of the big like bullet points, like more USB. More USB ports. Right, exactly. And now I've, I feel like I've sort of seen them take a step back. Like the, the, Nissan, Titan. the Nissan Titan we just had. Huge, uh, huge pickup truck. Um, I think we had what was it, the extended cab? Pro Four X, yeah, yeah, Four-door. like one USB port in it. One, one front yeah, or back. Solid, oh, like yeah, truck yeah, with a, with a three and a half millimeter auxiliary jack underneath that. What do I need that for? Exactly, yeah, especially so, with iPhones. So ben much and I were fighting it. over the one USB port, and I've <laughs> and I've noticed that in a lot of other cars where TT it, didn't have any. It's touted as like a big family car or a big family truck or whatever, and it's got. One USB port. Ridiculous. I, I think that's absolutely absurd. Yeah. And I noticed it uh, in a couple of cars recently that we've gotten in that they have one. Yeah, and, they, and that's the way that everything is charged these days. And Now, yeah. I know they're using Bluetooth more and more for a lot of the connections. Uh, but I'm talking about strictly more yeah, charging. Not, so not many yeah. They're also making a push for doing a lot of wireless charging, which is True, odd because yeah, most yeah. – I, I, and I don't know the exact stats, but I feel like most people have an iPhone. And and you cannot wireless, wirelessly charge it. Not iPhone. without the adapter. And I'm sure there's still <laughs> plenty, and there's still there's plenty of Androids and 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 Windows phones that are, are capable of doing that. But like, instead of putting that in there, like it sounds cool. Just give me another USB port. Sure, mm-hmm. sure. It's got to be cheaper to do <laughs> another port. What do, it had a 12 volt socket up there. I noticed too. Yeah. Uh, does anybody have a current radar detector? What do they run off of? They still 12 volt sockets? I don't know. Or? I don't know. I don't That's know. a good question. That is a good question because if they're USB now, which they very well could be. Yeah, especially in the Titan. So I got one USB port for a radar detector. Not that I use one, but then where am I going to do with my phone? 
I mm. joked to Robinson because he still have a flip phone. <laughs> can, you, can you plug your flip phone into the 12 volt socket? And I'll use the USB port, and we're good. <laughs> Lauren, have you noticed anything like that? Do you try and connect up a lot of things when you're uh, driving? Yeah, well, I was just thinking the same thing. I mean, you have people in the back seat too who want to charge stuff. There's, you know, one USB in the front, and, you know, you've got people reaching over. Just, I mean, one for, you know, you've got four people in the car. But like you guys are saying, wireless, I've seen a lot of press events that have been going on, a lot of people pushing for wireless. But, yeah, if you've got an iPhone, like, you're kind of screwed. There's no remedy for you if there's only one USB. These users right. are the most important users. This, this particular <laughs> Titan had a one 10 volt AC in the back. But no USB. Yep. Well, it becomes you know, a safety hazard at that point because everybody's fighting over the one USB. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a good rant and rave, and I must say, it seems to me like they ought to be, you know, putting them on just about every unused Ooh, surface in the car. Up. Absolutely. Yeah. Like. All right, that's our rant and rave, and I thought that was a real, one of the best ones we've done in a long time. You're I want to thank our FYI reporter Lauren Morrison for calling in from Florida. You can say something, Lauren. <laughs> Oh, yes. yes. Like, great to, great to be with you. Like, you just stiff right. me on a high five. <laughs> our, we, our road test producer, Ben Davis. Our Thanks. online content coordinator, Patrick Lucas. Our assistant producer, Greg Carlos. Our audio engineer, Jim Bigwood. Podcast creator, Bob Mixter. Podcast producer, Patrick Lucas, the guy with yeah. the bell. Thank you all for listening and watching Motor Week. You can catch our show every week on public TV stations around the country and also on the Velocity Cable Channel and on our website, MotorWeek.org, we have lots of new content that you won't see anywhere else. Uh, be sure to check that out at MotorWeek.org. And uh, let's see, our, our YouTube site with hundreds and hundreds of videos. Oh, yeah. If you've got a computer or a television, you can find MotorWeek. If you're we on hope social you media, come on. Social media, join us, please. Sign up, whatever. We're here for you. Thank you very much for being a part of of Motor Week. You have been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by TireRack.com and by RockAuto.com. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at MotorWeek.org. And watch Motor Week, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.